2017. I completed my epilepsy fellowship in 2019. And uh, now I'm working as a research associate in University of Calgary. And hopefully this fall, I'll join as an academic neurologist in University of Manitoba. So uh, basically my talk, uh, I asked ma'am what I was supposed to do. I was a little surprised seeing my name and imaging in epilepsy, epilepsy. So she told me, you just have to introduce us at the stage for Keshav sir and Bijoy sir to do the radiology stuff. So I know that this is a mixed audience with you know, trainees and very senior epileptologists. I'll try and do justice. So this will be my scheme of presentation. I'll initially go walk through a person's a, a life of a person with epilepsy, right from the time he has the first seizure to pre-surgical evaluation and subsequent uh, management. And we'll see where MRI has a place in this journey. Next, I'll be speaking on uh, why epilepsy protocol is important. And then we'll discuss two cases if time permit. So uh, this is the, an important paper which I'll be quoting uh, in, uh, in, at many points during this presentation. So this is a recommendation given by the Neuroimaging Task Force of the ILA for imaging in epilepsy. And they collected data from the previous ILA recommendations from the experience of the authors at their own centers and also from 67 published studies with varying levels of evidence. So what is the evidence we have for um, having a structural MRI when a patient has a first seizure, but without a diagnosis of epilepsy. So the risk of seizure recurrence at one year when you have no known cause for your first seizure is around 10%. But if you have a lesion, it increases to about 29, 28%. Similarly, the five-year risk for seizure recurrence for a patient with no known cause for the first seizure is around 29%. And it increases to 48% when you have a lesion on the MRI. So definitely for predicting seizure recurrence and subsequently for diagnosis of epilepsy, we do require an imaging. So the ILE recommends in the 2019 recommendation that ideally a patient with a first seizure should have an epilepsy protocol, preferably in harness protocol MRI, which I will be briefly discussing subsequently. But they did mention that in certain circumstances, like in resource limited situations or in acute or urgent situations, you can still do a contrast or a non-contrast CT. But the clear guidelines for how non-contrast CT would be useful in a person with first seizure was given by the American Academy of Neurology in 2007, where they mentioned three situations where the yield would be maximum. That is when you have an abnormal neurological examination, a predisposition to epilepsy, either in the form of history, like having a history of trauma, or when you have a focal seizure onset. And they also mentioned that there are certain situations where CT might actually be even more helpful. Uh, when you have hemorrhages, when you have large tumors and stroke, calcified and bony lesions, and it's readily available, less expensive, it requires short scanning time, and is specifically useful in urgent situations and when you're dealing with pediatric patients. However, the downfalls are it is not as good in detecting infections, small neoplasms, in which case you might need contrast. It is not useful in detecting hippocampal sclerosis, focal cortical dysplasias, and the lesion detection rates in epilepsy is as low as 30%, quite contrasting MRI where it can go in different series up to even 80%. And obviously there is a very high risk of radiation exposure. And do we actually need a epilepsy protocol MRI? So this is one of the landmark studies published in 2002, where they compared how the expertise of an image reader and the MRI protocol would influence the lesion detection in cases of focal epilepsy. So if you have a non-expert reader and a standard MRI, the lesion detection was only around 39%. So this was from 123 patients with epileptogenic lesions who were admitted to the seizure monitoring unit. If you have an expert radiologist who reads a standard MRI, the lesion detection increases to 50%. But the deadly combination expert radiologist with an epilepsy protocol MRI, the lesion detection was as high as 91%. So a standard MRI from this series failed to detect about 57% of focal epileptogenic lesions. So why, what is an epilepsy protocol MRI? So this was one of the well done studies for an epilepsy protocol MRI by, by Belmer et al. So what they did was they studied 2,740 patients who had potential epileptogenic lesions and the epileptogenic lesions were divided into six categories like hippocampal sclerosis, tumors, etc. And the radiologists were asked to rate what sequences they thought was best to detect that specific lesion in its subtlest form. So the best sequence was the flare sequence, which could detect up to 84.8% of our lesions. And this is a cumulative ranking. When it was added with T2 images, it was 92%. When uh, 
sequences which detected hemocytrin and calcium were added, the detection rate went up to 97%. So they detected the first five top ranking sequences. However, when they des designed the protocol, they got rid of the contrast enhanced T1 because they thought it was not economically viable and it was not practical to give contrast for all patients with epilepsy. And then they def defined this essential six epilepsy protocol which included the best sequences and also the radiologists were asked to rate depending on the slice thickness, plane orientation and plane angulation, which I won't be discussing in detail. But as always, no recommendations and protocols stay forever. In 2019, this was the ILA proposal for the harness protocol, epilepsy protocol. So this is the 3D protocol at three Tesla for T1 weighted and flare images. I will not go in detail for this. But the next slide is important. This is the 2D protocol for 3-Tesla, which is specifically for a coronal T2-weighted sequence. And this helps in detecting the most common, you know, the bread and butter of epileptologist hippocampal sclerosis. So these are the coronal sequences taken through the anterior, mid, and posterior section of the hippocampus. So here you can see a sagittal section where you can see that the anterior cut is through the head of the hippocampus mid cut is through the body and the posterior cut is through the tail of the hippocampus. And you can see on an enlarged image how well the dentate gyrus and the cornoamonis are being clearly defined in this epilepsy protocol. And now we move on to, we move to the next stage in the timeline of an epilepsy patient when he has a newly diagnosed epilepsy, should we do an MRI? For sure, detection of lesion is a strong indicator for drug resistance. This might seem a little uh, saddening, but when you have a lesion, obviously you have an early window for surgical option and your surgical outcomes are much, much more when you have a lesion on the MRI. And from multiple studies, early surgery offers better outcomes. So if you image a patient, have a lesion, you are likely to have a better outcome for the patient. But there are certain gray zones in the ILA recommendation. What do you do with self-limiting syndromes like BEX? So 15% of BEX can have an abnormal MRI. So should we be chasing the MRI for these subgroup of patients? And what do we do of genetic generalized epilepsy? So this is one of the studies which gave the guidelines for imaging in patients, in children with recent onset epilepsy. And this is holds good even now. And I'll just deal uh, with the ones which are specific for children. So when you have developmental regression, imaging is indicated. Less than two years of age, imaging is indicated because there are certain conditions, pathologies like dysplasias, which are best seen in those images. And certain sequences like DSTER sequences are specifically used for this pediatric age group because of the difference in myelination. Symptomatic generalized epilepsies like LGS, because if you're lucky, you might find a lesion and resection might give seizure freedom or control. Increased intracranial pressure, history of status epilepticus, and atypical cause for BEX or uh, idiopathic generalized epilepsy. And imaging is not indicated definitely for your typical BEX and the genetic generalized epilepsy. But we do, at circum certain circumstances, do imaging for MRI, uh, uh, do imaging for genetic generalized epilepsy. So when is that? Usually in our practice, we do it when they become medication resistant because medication resistance in genetic generalized epilepsy is usually in the ballpark of about 15%, quite unlike focal epilepsies where there is, it is around 30%. And if you identify a lesion, you offer the patient a surgical option and that is the best chance at achieving seizure freedom for the patient. So we deliberate on the history, the semiology, on the EEG findings in an attempt to try and figure out whether we made a misdiagnosis, but it often doesn't help. And genetic generalized epilepsy, unfortunately, doesn't have a specific signature or a diagnostic hallmark. So aura might be seen in up to 70%, so that is not going to help. Focality in semiology doesn't help. Having focal myoclonic jerks doesn't help. Automatisms are common in absence epilepsy, but this doesn't help in differentiating it from focal epilepsies. Focal IEDs, asymmetric generalized IEDs, septic asymmetric pattern might not be always helpful. And when it comes to the ictal rhythm, sometimes we do have non-generalized or irregular ictal, item in, ictal onset in genetic generalized epilepsy, even up to 46%. So that is not helpful. And to complicate things, you can have three hertz generalized spike and wave discharges in patients with focal epilepsy. You have symptomatic generalized epilepsies, which mimic idiopathic generalized epilepsies. And to confuse things further, you have coexistence of focal and generalized epilepsies. So if you image a patient with genetic generalized epilepsies, we usually run into more trouble because this is a series where they studied 143 patients with genetic generalized epilepsies and imaged them. And they found that 24% of them had an abnormal MRI. And the MRI abnormalities were arachnoid cyst, some basal ganglia abnormalities, diffuse cortical atrophy, ventricular abnormalities, white matter lesions in the frontal region, hippocampal asymmetry, 
gliosis in the frontal region and certain gyral abnormalities. So from these, they thought only the white matter abnormalities and focal gyral abnormalities could be potentially epileptogenic and they accounted for about 12% of the abnormal MRI. Now, what do we make of these uh, white matter abnormalities? So this is a study which was published early this year where they looked into the focal frontal lesions which were found in patients with genetic generalized epilepsy, trying to figure out where, whether they were actually epileptogenic or not. So they divided people into two groups, those which had migratory like MRI abnormalities, that is those which resemble focal cortical dysplasias like the transmantle sign, and those which had non-migratory MRI abnormalities. So there were six patients in the migratory group, and their MRI showed these non-specific changes like transmantle, like signal, periventricular signal, or both. And the semiology was lateralizing in about 50% to the lesion. Family history and history of febrile seizure was found in five. Scalp EG was having concordant IEDs to the lesion in two out of six. And ictal onset was concordant to the lesion in two out of six, but it was asymmetric ictal onset. And two patients actually had intracranial monitoring and they did have uh, onset from the focal premo frontal premotor area, but it was not lateralized. That is what we would expect in genetic generalized epilepsy. In the other group, which had non-migratory MRI abnormalities, it was varied pathology, meningiomas, astrocytoma, cystic lesions, post-traumatic lesions. And here, the lateralizing semiology was found in only 25%, family history in about 50%. There were no concordant IEDs to the lesion on the scalp recording, and intracranial EG was done in none. In the migratory abnormality group, three patients actually underwent surgery. And as expected, there was no post-operative change in seizure frequency or semiology. And histopathology was kind of non-specific, mild MCD, oligodendroglial hyperplasia, et cetera. So from this study, they concluded that dysplasia-like radial lesions are probably non-specific and don't play a role in ictogenesis. However, they can have atypical semiological features or EEG results. Now, when do you do repeat MRI in a patient? Obviously, if you have a low strength MRI, so according to all guidelines, you should have a minimum magnet strength of 1.5 Tesla. And also, if you have a non-epilepsy protocol MRI, when the patients become medication resistant or drug refractory, and to be more economical, you can wait for the pre-surgical evaluation and then decide whether you actually want to do an MRI. When you have progressive lesions like Rasmussen's encephalitis, tumors, uh, lesions like amygdala enlargement, which have to be followed up, when a patient has a negative MRI under two years of age, you should repeat it at least after two years or can be repeated if facility is permitted every six months. After a major brain insert like a status epilepticus, major trauma or encephalitis, or if a patient has a new semiology, a change in semiology, new neurologic, unexplained cognitive or behavioral changes. Now, what about MRI in patients who are intracranial monitoring? Definitely for preoperative planning because you can plan the trajectory and avoid vascular conflicts. Post implantation to confirm electrode locations and assess complications. So this is one of our patients. You can see that the patient had an MRI with the electrodes. These are the intracranial electrodes. You can see the complication of a hematoma, which is in the tract of a depth electrode. And this is a CT of the same patient here. You can see a lot of metal streak artifacts from the intracranial electrodes and the hematoma, even though it is seen, can be easily missed if they are small. But always remember that there are safety issues for scanning a patient in the MRI with the intracranial electrodes, mainly related to thermal injury and displacement of the electrodes. And this is of specific importance recently because there was a recall of the safety manual for patients who were undergoing MRI with attic electrodes, and there was a lot of commotion between different epilepsy centers. So certain sequences, which are called high SAR sequences, like the flare, are associated with significant heating and can cause significant thermal injury, and it is more so with higher magnet strengths. So this is our unpublished data where we looked into the safety of intracranial electrodes in the MRI. So we had 66 patients who underwent three Tesla intracranial EEG fMRI and 108 patients who had structural MRI at 1.5 Tesla, but limited sequences. None of them had any significant complications related to the scanning. So I'll move to the uh, cases. The first case is a 31 year old lady who had seizures since nine years of age no known antecedents, focal impaired awareness seizures weekly, focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures monthly. This was her semiology. She feels like she had a black shadow close to her face, fear, and as she felt as if the shadow was trying to threaten her and then choke her. So this is her scalp EEG, which shows uh, the ictal rhythm. You can see a semi-rhythmic one to two hertz 
delta maximum over the right temporal, which almost spreads to the parasagittal and later to the midline within about uh, six seconds. There were no intractal epileptiform discharges on the uh, recording. So this is the MRI showing a heterotopia over the uh, frontal horn of the right lateral ventricle. And on the other side, on the left side, she had a dysplasia in the frontal operculum. And you can see somewhat like a tail extending almost close to the ventricular lining. So this patient also had an ictal spect where you can see that the hyperperfusion is in the right insula and the right mesial temporal region. So obviously we have two potential epileptogenic lesions and even though the ictal rhythm was uh, lateralized, we needed to map out the cortex. So this is the depth electrode going in close to the uh, heterotopia on the right side. It's almost hitting the ventricular margin. And on the left side, you have the frontal operculum covered by an electrode where we had the focal cortical dysplasia. So this was the intrictal data. You, we had very active intrictal right mesial temporal with the amygdala anterior and the posterior hippocampus involved. And less active intrictally was the orbitofrontal on the right and the anterior insula on the right. So this is the ictal rhythm. So you, here you can see the right anterior superior temporal, which is possibly why the patient had the auditory hallucinations. And here you can see low voltage fast ictal rhythm with active fast spread to the right amygdala, anterior hippocampus, posterior hippocampus, and later to the right posterior insula. So the seizure onset zone was at the right anterior superior temporal with immediate spread to the mesial temporal structures and then late spread to the lateral orbital frontal and the right posterior insula. And there were also electrographic seizures which were kind of flipping between the lateral orbital frontal and the anterior insula. So this was the seizure rising, electrographic seizure rising from the right anterior insula spreading to the right lateral orbital frontal. So the patient underwent a multilobar resection involving the anterior temporal lobe, the orbital frontal on the right, and also part of the anterior insula. Here you can see how well the MRI can demarcate the borders of the lesion, of the resection, sorry. So here you can see the three long gyri of the insula, the posterior three long gyri, and the anterior one and a half. So one short gyri has only been resected half. So this is again one of the important uses of MRI in assessing the completeness of resection and also to look into post-operative complications and long-term sequelae like gliosis. So the message is always, as always, if you have a lesion, follow the lesions. All lesions may not be epileptogenic as we saw for the focal cortical dysplasia here. And an epileptogenic lesion may just be the tip of the iceberg, just as we saw the heterotopia, even though we know that the heterotopia per se may be inert and the overlying cortex may be abnormal and always evaluate for surgical candidacy. This patient was not referred to the epilepsy service for almost two years because the community neurologist thought that they, both the lesions were contributing to her seizures. Now, come to the last case. It's a 15-year-old boy with elastic seizures since three years of age, currently in remission, focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizures since nine years of age, having occurring weekly, focal impaired awareness seizures since five years of age with almost 10 episodes every day. The semiology was behavioral arrest, left hand posturing, heavy breathing, and he had moderate intellectual disability. I think the diagnosis is all. The patient had a hypothalamic which is quite big. It's almost 23 millimeters in its maximum diameter. This is just another sequence uh, showing that it predominantly arises from the left side. The patient underwent uh, a laser ablation. So this is the trajectory of the laser through the left frontal approach and this is the post-operative image done on the second post-event uh, post-intervention day. So here you can see the hypointensity of the thermal injury and the surrounding hyper intense rim which is usually characteristic of thermal injury. So why, why is uh, this important? Because the hypothalamic hematoma are actually ectopic neurons. So they are not supposed to be communicating with the rest of the brain and when they start communicating you start having all these manifestations you know, epilepsy, neurobehavioral manifestations, etc. So the long-time um, agenda for the treatment of hypothalamic hematoma is to disconnect it. So all surgeries have focused on disconnecting the border of the hypothalamic hematoma from the rest of the brain. But unfortunately, there are critical structures in the border like the hypothalamus per se, the mammillary bodies, bodies the phonesis, and also the internal capsule, which is nearby. So hypothalamic hematoma have always been challenging. But it would have been very useful if we could find out the specific epileptogenic zone within the hypothalamic hematoma, because then you don't have to go near the border of the hypothalamic hematoma. So there has been a lot of studies trying to figure out how the functional connectivity of the hypothalamic hematoma is. 
and i would just like to stop with this study so this is a study which specifically activity of the hypothalamic hamartoma voxel by voxel with the rest of the brain and their intention was to try and be very selective super selective in ablating the potential epileptogenic nodes within the hypothalamic hamartoma so here on the left side you can see all the voxels and on the right you can see the cortical connectivity so they would map out the voxels whichever voxels did not have connectivity with the rest of the brain were eliminated and they selectively ablated the voxels which had connectivity with the rest of the brain so what is the advantage here you are trying to localize the epileptogenic zone within the hypothalamic hamartoma using a resting state fmri and you are ablating it thereby you can avoid you no know, manipulating or you no know, lingering around the borders of the hypothalamic hamartoma so what was the outcome when they did just laser ablation without guidance from the resting state uh, fmri they ablated almost the same amount of tissue but you can see that the seizure reduction was significantly and statistically higher by the resting state fmri to guide the epileptogenic zone ablation and even the seizure freedom was significantly increased when they used resting state fmri and i won't go into the uh, other invasive studies so this is what uh, mri can do especially when it comes to invas non invasive minimally invasive procedures they can be used in radio surgery laser ablation radio frequency thermocoagulation and mr guided ultrasound and we have possibly reached a stage where we don't even need a neurologist to uh, you know for a pre surgical rounds for uh, hypothalamic hamartoma because a radiologist and a neurosurgeon can decide what is to be ablated so that is radio surgery uh, based on functional mri mapping so this is my last slide so from over the years we have uh, gone from ictal onset zones epileptogenic zones to epileptic networks and epileptogenic uh, nodes and networks but even then uh, even though it looks uh, like you know we are dealing with more regions of the brain we are aiming more towards minimally invasive or you no know, selective procedures and this has been made possible only because of imaging technology and the use of invasive eeg so imaging in epilepsy is uh, you know built on three important pillars one is the clinical judgment the availability of good quality images both of which we discussed and an expert radiologist and i think now vijay sir will be you know showing the bad apples of how you know bad clinical judgment and bad images can you know uh, lead to misdiagnosis and wrong management and thank you for your patient listening yes that was wonderful joseph very crisp and clear and um, musa ji you will agree with me that 80 minutes so i think uh, yeah two thumbs are up only two thumbs yes okay fine uh, we'll move on to bijoy's one and then uh, we'll hear from keshav ji and then come back and take the questions if you have any bijoy please i don't think bijoy needs a again another one more introduction he was already introduced <laughs> 24 hours back that would be uh, too much so bijoy please Joseph was excellent. Nothing else I want to add to that. Thank Very you. awesome talk. If all of you can uh, mute yourself, uh, the technical glitches of having a poor audio would be rather under control. I think that many people, at least around eight or ten of you, are still not. doing that would you please do that including me i'm going to mute myself uh good morning and uh, good evening to all of you uh, thank you for this invitation i'll be talking about what we are usually missing or misinterpret and how can we avoid this so if you look at uh, uh, i'm going to talk to you about 10 golden rules in epilepsy imaging uh, and interpretation these right. are my rules not so um don't yeah. get irritated people are coming in now so that's why okay. this yeah yeah so so, so the first uh, the first rule is that uh, uh, where do you uh, review these images uh, most of the time we you uh, uh, review these images on a routine tablet uh, computer tablet monitor tablet is going to come it is very severe going to is so uh, we have to 
Uh, diagnostic quality enterprise monitor that is in the PAX monitor, which is quite expensive. So we will not be able to do that most of the time in the clinics, but at least you should do a very high resolution monitor like an Apple monitor with an Osirix series. But what is happening really is that most of the time we will be forced to interpret images which are sent through WhatsApp and all. So uh, I'm actually breaking my own rule most of the time, but uh, uh, that is not the correct thing. You are going to miss a lot of things. Uh, unless you want to become Miss India, you should not actually interpret anything on a WhatsApp image. Second is uh, 1.5 Tesla versus 3 Tesla versus 70. So uh, Dr. Joseph has uh, actually told you about the harness protocol and they, uh, they definitely they uh, prefer a 3T, but uh, they, at least a 1.5 Tesla sequence should be important. But the but the key is that the sequence optimization is the key. Even if you're using a 1.5 Tesla uh, machine, uh, it has to, the images has to be, imaging has to be optimized. For example, uh, you can actually see a lot of things. If this was a, an image from 2005, uh, you can see that in 3D itself, you can see that uh, uh, you could actually see more things, veins, cortical dysplasia is better. And because of the high spatial uh, resolution and the signal to noise ratio, you can do that. So uh, in the harness protocol also, they have actually included even 3D, a high resolution coronal, which is going to be a bread and butter sequence because we can see the hippocampal anatomy very well. And uh, that is going to be the most common pathology we are going to see. This uh, paper has already been introduced uh, and uh, this is the basic minimum sequence they are advising. This is not that we should actually uh, limit yourself to this sequence all the time because uh, we can have more sequences, especially in research setting like uh, NASL and SWA, which is going to solve more problems. So uh, these are the base three three basic minimum sequences. You have to have a 3D T1TA sequence, a 3D flare sequence, and a 2D uh, T2 a high resolution FSC sequence. So this is what you can do if you are actually doing a high resolution sequence. You can see the coronomonis, uh, the different parts of the coronomonis, as well as the dendate uh, gyrus you can see the dendrite gyrus and the ca4 ca3 ca2 and the ca1 and continuous as continuing as the subiculum and this is the, exactly what you see in a new and stain on uh, after surgery or so uh look at the uh, the this is a 1.5 tesla image if actually optimizing these sequences uh, with a very high resolution Probably is going to take a little more time. You can actually detect most of the pathology, for example, the depth of the sulcus displacement, which can be very well seen on a 3D flare sequence. We have been using this uh, even from when we had only a 1.5 Tesla. Now we have both 1.5 and 3T. Now we have actually shifted most of our epilepsy uh, uh, imaging to 3T. So uh, uh, we are, uh, when we are looking at the hippocampal sclerosis, we are also looking at the neocortical changes, uh, the significance of which can vary. We have actually uh, uh, looked at the pathology of this. Um, most of the time, they don't show uh, uh, neuronal losses uh, or new and staining. This could be due to a secondary change or it could be due to a primary uh, uh, dysplastic uh, lesion, which is producing a secondary hippocampal sclerosis. And uh, uh, this is very difficult to predict uh, preoperatively from MR imaging alone. We had a session previously on amygdala and the significance of amygdala uh, hypertrophy and hyperintensity. And uh, the most important thing in, uh, in uh, uh, hippocampal or uh, epilepsy imaging is actually not to miss the second lesion. Like uh, Joseph has shown you a case of uh, uh, heterotopia with the contralateral dysplasia. Like hippocampal sclerosis, in this case, it is very obvious. You can see a uligary and gliosis in the parietal lobe. There can be very subtle dysplasias which are missed. That should not happen here. Uh, see this. There will be specific questions from the uh, the neurologist, epileptologist, whether there's a subtle changes, for example, internal architecture of this hippocampus is lost. This may be an early sign of hippocampal sclerosis. There can be bilateral sclerosis and which side is more involved. All these questions are uh, to be answered. The third rule is that know your sequence as well. Yes, optimization is really important, but you should also know what these radiologists are actually talking about. For example, neurologists, epileptologists will be very fond of this sequence, the T2 relaxometry. When they are in doubt, uh, they go for, uh, of a hippocampal sclerosis, subtle changes, they go for a T2 relaxometry. That is looking at the T2 values of uh, to do relaxation values of the hippocampus. If it is more, it usually suggests that that side is more abnormally uh, involved. 
For example, if you look at the 1.5 Tesla values, which is published in the literature, if you extrapolate it to 3T, that doesn't work because on 3T, the T2 values will actually come down. T1 values will go up, T2 values will come down. We have actually optimized on our 1.5 Tesla up to 110 milliseconds, maybe normal, or 100 to 110 milliseconds, whereas in 3T, the normal can be much lower. You see in 95 to 100. So unless you know these differences, it will be very difficult actually to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to corroborate your findings from the published literature. So there is a difference between the relaxation. Also, what sequence you're using, whether you're using a four uh, echo time, uh, eight echo time, or 16 echo time, you're using a synthetic MRI. Depending on that, these values may change. And also the flare, uh, because these are uh, paleocortices, the flare, it can be slightly hyperintense just by looking at the insula, especially the contralateral insula. If it is more hyperintense, you can actually predict that the hippocampal sclerosis is actually there. So uh, quantitative uh, imaging, especially spectroscopy, which is not um, much used, but uh, for research as well as when they were in doubt, you should also know that the anterior uh, hippocampus, the choline levels will be slightly higher and the posterior hippocampus, uh, your uh, NA levels uh, will be higher. So there is a regional difference in choline NA and if you are actually doing this for uh, studies, you should actually compare only the head to head and the tail to tail. So this is also very important. And the most important thing, which is again uh, expressed in the harness study, because why they are using for uniform protocol is basically I understand is that they want to do everything to machine learning and actually go into automated uh, uh, detection and that's a very good thing but uh, we should also understand that uh, when you are going for automation automatic detection and with uh, uh, artificial intelligence it is going to come more and more but you should always uh, know that there is a limitation they can have a uh, abnormal noise in this and this is also true for a uh, functional MRI most of the people when they see very good images they will be very happy but there is a difference between a 3T and a 1.5 Tesla. In 1.5 Tesla, your activated voxels in the cortex can be at least 1.5 to 2 centimeters away from the actual cortical stimulation or electrical activity because there is a venerar wash of the bold. It is more accurate in a 3T Tesla, not only really because it is actually having high signal. Again, same for uh, DTI sequences. Most people think that these are absolute true uh, values uh, than there are uh, uh, two uh, 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 true fiber tracks, but it is only a representation of uh, the axonal bundles. They are, by, with the brain shift, there can be changed because uh, even with the sequences by just eddy, correction of eddy current in the MR scanner, you can actually introduce or reduce uh, more fibers. So everything you have to take with a pinch of salt. Then the, the fourth rule is that when you see nothing, you have to see really, really hard, especially when uh, you are uh, sure about and you have to always correlate with your electrophysiology and the clinical data. So for example, when it's uh, when you're talking about hippocampal sclerosis, when you do your routine sequences, you're not seeing anything. That's why you have to monitor all these things in real time on your scanner and otherwise it, you are going to miss it. For example, this is hippocampal sclerosis possible. Uh, it was uh, uh, sent for a, a mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. You are not seeing anything. Then we do a very high resolution, thin titivated sequence. You can see a small encephalocele there and a herniation of the meninge uh, through the anterior uh, sphenoid uh, uh, middle cranial fossa floor. So if you do the uh, high resolution CT, which can be added, where immediately if you see, you can see that the brain is actually herniating along with the meninges into the sphenoid through the uh, defect in the sphenoid bone. And uh, this is, uh, is another case. You can see mentioencephalocele, which is actually going through the sphenoid sinus for the probably the Gans canal. And uh, and uh, never uh, you should miss a hypothalamic hematoma. It's a great mimic. You should always make sure that your uh, uh, checklist includes uh, looking at the uh, the uh, tuber sinarium and the hypothalamic uh, areas. And uh, sometimes it will be very difficult. We are very uh, the epileptology is sure that uh, there is a displacia there when we carefully see that uh, in the basic frontal region there is a subtle displacement it may be extending into the uh, in the, the olfactory bulb and again uh, you can see in the anterior uh, uh, and the quadrantic hemimegalencephaly and even hemimegalencephaly can be olfactory nerve also can be thickened and this may uh, be a very uh, important finding uh, uh, for uh, uh, showing this up. So you have to very carefully see and also you should uh, look at uh, when you see a large lesion, you should not be uh, very happy. You should know, I uh, look at the poster force, I look at the brainstem and this may be a genetic syndrome. And for this case, it's a 2 a mutation and this has got a very important, uh, important uh, clinical significance. You're not going to operate on these children. When you see nothing, for example, in this case, which is already shown and uh, when you see nothing, you have to do a spectroscopy. Sometimes the only finding may be absence of creatine. This is a creatine transporter deficiency, you treat it. 
and uh, patient significantly improves you can see the creatinine coming back so when you see nothing you have to you have to go and find out uh, if there is a tapletologist is sure that uh, if something is there and uh, dis dysplasias are chameleons so they can change colors actually they change shades of gray which is already described mm -hmm. very beautifully in mm -hmm. the previous lecture by uh, dr mosa you can see that uh, uh, this case uh, if you don't uh, see carefully uh, depending on the myelination there can be uh, hypermyelination, hypermyelination. can you please mute your mic so uh, you can see that uh, this uh, case in occipital uh, seizures uh, we can see that the right side uh, when the patient was 11 month old you can see that the, uh, the white matter is uh, not clearly seen that it's a poor gray wire differentiation large dysplasia there and in situated images it's pretty much difficult now uh, to find out but when the patient was younger two month old you can see there is a large area of a poor gray wire differentiation in the right occipital lobe compared to the left side when it was actually not completely myelinated it's also true in the T1 weighted image, it was very difficult, but you can again see the myelination track which you expect because the uh, the posterior uh, uh, the myelinated tracks, the visual pathways are not uh, clearly seen. So you can actually detect, uh, and earlier you detect uh, the earlier the surgery, the, the disease outcome will be better. So the sixth rule is that not everything that, that looks like a dysplasia is a dysplasia. So we, when we, a patient has got a very high seizure frequency, we tend to uh, uh, report everything as dysplasia. For example, this is the classical transmantle sign. Even it can be T1D, uh, hyperintensity can be t one detail. You see it, there will be balloon cells that may be protective. We have seen, heard uh, in the previous lectures. And uh, this is a video of just uh, when our uh, new uh, uh, hospital wing is uh, uh, getting constructed. If you see this, uh, when you see, when you are sure about a lesion, sometimes it may not be true. What you're seeing may not be always true. For example, this case initially we saw that uh, uh, there is a hyper intensity, there was a postical, we made a postical period patient had a very uh, high seizure uh, fre uh, frequency, and you can see the even postical uh, hyperperfusion. There is a lactate in the area, and uh, this is uh, what happens after a follow up after say a few months this is uh, this disappears so when you see these solutions we thought still there can be underlying microdysplasia and this postural phenomenon is getting corrected so again the patient comes back uh, uh, in a few months uh, again you have when you see these lesions you tend to think of uh, either an autoimmune encephalitic process or a mitochondrial process and this turned out to be an autoimmune encephalitic process and uh, when we were very sure that uh, for example a poor gray wire differentiation in the left frontal lobe and high perfusion i was very sure that this a dysplasia this turned out to be a moge so it's a mild, uh, mild malformation of cortical development uh, with a oligodendroglial hyperplasia uh, and epilepsy uh, even though we are not completely wrong in calling it a dysplasia but it's actually an entirely different pathology yeah. and uh, you can see some uh, this is a 45 year old female you see a lesion there in the right uh, uh, motor cortex a patient presenting with a uh, 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 sorry uh, 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 left upper limb, uh, lower limb seizure, sorry. So you can see in the right motor cortex, you, you see a lesion. You tend to, uh, if it is a first time seizure in 45 years, you tend to think that is a glioma. But you follow it up, you see that there is an atrophy and there is a, a minimal hypo intensity. If you do an SWI, uh, you can see there is some blooming. And if you do higher resolution, it's actually a developmental venous anomaly, which has actually bled which is produced edema and it produced seizures. So, uh, and uh, I come to the last three rules. ASL, arterial spin labeling, as well as uh, PET imaging is your friend, but be careful. It is, uh, uh, there are several papers which are looking at the tail onset zone now. You are looking at the, the, the networks and nodes. I don't know how, how far it will be useful. There are several papers recently published on usefulness of ASL. We also found that, and also even comparing with the PET, we also found that it is very useful. For example, this left front uh, dysplasia, you can see hypoperfusion uh, on ASL, and it is also seen on hypermetabolism in PET. And uh, this is hippocampal sclerosis. So on the left side, left uh, hippocampal shows uh, hyperperfusion. Uh, you can also uh, see hyperperfusion in the perictal image in the right hippocampus in this case, and it is really, really useful. So, for example, sometimes it will be even useful in detecting that type of leptogenic substrate. For example, here it looks like okay, but the, the leptologist and the electrophysiology is very clear that it is an occipital seizures. If you look at the interictal or a, a routine ASL, you see some usually occipital lobe, there will be hyperperfusion because of the, uh, the patient uh, eye opening. And uh, you see compared to the right side, there is actually hyperperfusion. That means it is abnormal. So you adjust the window of the flare, you can see there is a, a gliotic focus there in the left occipital lobe and can be very well picked up uh, by ASL first.
in uh, autoimmune uh, the the rasmussen sense of light is you see that initially the left hemisphere is uh, a, a, is uh, uh, swollen later it goes for uh, uh, atrophy and this is one finding we, we always almost always see that most of the atrophied hemisphere will show hyperperfusion but there will be areas which are showing hyperperfusion in this because and they, we have recently published that there is a focal brain inflammation or is there a postictal phenomenon it is still not uh, completely confirmed and sometimes uh, you see this very high uh, this is uh, the routine mr looks normal but patient has got a very high uh, seizure frequency and a very post immediate post ictal period you see this hyperperfusion you don't know whether the right side is abnormal perfused or the left side is actually hyperperfused you adjust the window this is what you even if you are getting a two uh, t1 i um, mean t2 flare in a i mean a, a flare images on 1.5 tesla if you do a high resolution scan even adjust your window narrowing your window you can actually say that you can actually see a lot of things because the cortical edema is more on the right side again you see the insular cortex because it's a pallet cortex you can see it is bright this is normal so hippocampus is also bright but if it is uh, the neocortex if it is bright it is abnormal so sometimes again this patient presents with a focal seizures right frontal region the opercular region you see a lesion it could be a dysplasia but in the previous image it was normal so we think that is most likely an autoimmune phenomenon and the in the previous interictal pet you see hyperperfusion i mean hypometabolism but this patient immediately after seizures you can see on asl hyperperfusion so you tend tend to believe that when you see this this is very characteristic of a seizure localization may not be always true for example in this case post hippocampal hyperperfusion but uh, clearly the localization electrophysiology is anterior hippocampal so what you are seeing as when there is an epileptic march and uh, we are only seeing the uh, the blood flow changes associated with when you are actually catching up it after it has actually spread to the posterior hippocampus we are seeing this many for many months i i believe that uh, if you see postictal hyperperfusion it is going to be more localizing it may not be true for example this case bilateral uh, uligyria uh, the, the electrophysiologically the localization is more towards the right side but on asl we are seeing more hyperperfusion on the left side so asl can be again you should be very careful about the asl artifacts sometimes we see no perfusion on the side but when we look at there was a small uh, pilot tube uh, spring which is producing this artifact when we correct it to the center you uh, the perfusion comes back so the asl can produce artifacts now the last rule neurosonography is very versatile especially for preoperative navigation so we have talked about the pre perioperative uh, uh, lead placement and uh, perioperative mri which is very expensive but uh, the how uh, when the perioperative or preoperative mri is not available how the neurosurgeon is uh, doing a resection is basically by looking at uh, the the preoperative mri and navigation and also looking and palpating the brain uh, uh, because usually the okay, I mean, the excuse me So, excuse me can you please mute so um if you look at uh, this uh, this uh, they, they just palpate and if the usually the focal cortical dysplasia will have a harder uh, consistency for example this was a failed case even with navigation uh, the the surgeon missed in the initial attempt because it has they have actually operated posterior to the dysplasia so uh, uh, when you uh, go back uh, we have now uh, uh, a uh, navigation good navigation system with an ultrasound probe which can be navigated and uh, this is uh, the 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 repeat surgery you can see this is the previous clavicular cavity postoperative cavity and this is actually the uh, the focal cortical dysplasia with the transmandibular sign there so now it is very easy you, you open the uh, open the skull and uh, uh, before the dura is uh, Uh, removed and and uh, this is not the way you are actually seeing the ultrasound i have actually uh, shifted it uh, 90 degrees so, so that uh, it uh, matches the mri and it can be even navigated to the mr so we can actually superimpose uh, this on the screen so the surgeon it is very easy for this uh, surgery was finished in less than 15 minutes uh, after the this was actually occlusion it is very easy for the surgeon to go and completely resect it and you can see the dysplasia this is very high resolution probe if you directly put on the dura this is what you see and i can clearly differentiate between uh, displaced dysplastic cortex uh, uh, compared to 
normal cortex and this is the previous cavity which is also much hyper compared to the dysplasia so this is uh, uh, the perioperative finding so this is another case this is not a dysplasia this is how you see and uh, this is a very very useful uh, tool uh, and always look for innovations there can be simple solutions for very complex problems for example we have published uh, dr ash has published this paper uh, some time back uh, looking at the mayer's loop which can, we can actually predict uh, uh, the visual outcome after a uh, i mean temporal lobectomy this is extremely difficult actually to superimpose uh, this uh, this uh, a lot of post processing is required this uh, this fiber tractography on a cutivated sequences now but now we have the quantitative susceptibility mapping and even padre processing after sw you can actually see this uh, uh, myelin because myelin also shows susceptibility and in the lower sections you can actually if you do a mip uh, or a minimal intensity uh, projections uh, mip you can actually see the maze look very well directly on a an sw a quantitative susceptibility map and uh, we you know how much we have actually struggled uh, after putting these uh, grids and actually find out uh, uh, imagine after making 3d uh, sequences uh, uh, and uh, uh, superimposing on a 3d sequences uh, especially on mri and now we have uh, with uh, uh, from our uh, cardiac radiology colleagues they are actually routinely using 3d printing for a uh, very complex surgeries and i have actually even uh, asked them to uh, get a small skull printed for me and this is a skull printing and uh, this is the same thing can be used for uh, uh, even uh, perioperative assessment preoperative assessment even grid placement assessment everything can be actually printed uh, nowadays and it's coming up in a big, big way and there is a very recent uh, publication in uh, jmri on this so the 10th rule is the most important rule and uh, nothing can clean, uh, replace teamwork most of the time we get a, a patchy uh, uh, a requisition for uh, where the seizure uh, localization will be but what we decide always uh, decision is always made in an epilepsy meeting so that uh, we have the full details even though we don't understand much of their uh, electrophysiology we uh, we get a more localization and we review all the images and uh, nothing can replace teamwork and thank you very much for your kind attention i hope i have not crossed time thank you so much vijay i mean you haven't crossed your time um 10 minutes more we have for kshg um a few of the participants have put some remarks that uh, uh at least part of it was greek and latin for them uh, i should confess that it is the same for all of us at least majority of us so it doesn't matter and uh, it is wonderful as ever so let's hear from uh, dr keshav das sir is uh, the professor and head of department of uh, radiology and uh, for most of us he's a teacher uh, so sir will be wrapping it up and then we'll take few questions also so please can you see my screen uh, not yet sir not screen can you share it once again Vijay, can you close it? Can I already close? Yeah, sure. So, yes, I can see you. And by the way, we had uh, 280 people at the peak and now slowly the attrition is coming. That's okay. Um, but I think it's a topic which everybody wants to listen to, not the just the purview of the epileptologist alone. Yes, sir. Now you can, we can see. Okay. So uh, we had two talks uh, and uh, thank you, Joseph. And thank you, Bijoy, for covering the topic. Uh, of uh, imaging in epilepsy and what I will be doing is I will be just telling uh, uh, about a summary of the talks of uh, the neurologist and the radiologist and just to add few more points uh, so what was the neurologist telling uh, it was about the epilepsy protocol which is getting more and more important and you know the importance of 3D sequences which has uh, come in the 3D flare and the 3D T2 weighted sequence is relatively newer sequence but it can actually give a lot of information and that's what is the harness protocol given most of the importance to and that uh, is something which we have to start doing 3d sequences uh, the time for 3d sequences is more and also interpretation time is also more 
uh, for 3D sequence and I'll show you how. The next is about the indications for imaging in infants and children. And Joseph uh, told about the importance of doing repeat imaging and that is extremely important. In children, many times uh, when the myelination is not complete, there is a possibility that you might miss uh, uh, lesions early on. Later on, you start seeing it. And then after some time, it disappears. So that's why you might have to repeat it every, uh, sometimes six monthly. Uh, 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 below two years, that is what uh, 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 they say. But it is very important that in one of the MRs, probably you might pick up such a lesion. The third thing he was uh, telling was about the genetic generalized epilepsy with migratory lesions in MRI. This was the first time I was hearing it, and I'm sure that many of the radiologists who are listening here might also be uh, hearing these migratory lesions uh, um, for the first time, where you, uh, one of the papers uh, showed a frontal hyperintensities uh, in the MRI. Uh, but uh, such lesions might be seen. The radiologists might report those lesions because they are seen. It might be heterotopias, transmantle sign, um, uh, poor gray white distinctions. These are written. But the significance of that in reducing the seizures has to be evaluated by the uh, epileptologists. The indications for repeat MRI was again uh, told. And uh, as uh, you know, uh, in Rasmussen's encephalitis and conditions where there is progression of the disease, autoimmune encephalitis when semiology changes. Um, in many of these conditions, you have to repeat an MRI. And he really emphasized the importance of doing an MRI, which is in a low Tesla machine, done initially with a poor protocol. I should say a poor protocol because many times, even the flare sequence which is taken is done, just done in one plane, and you tend to miss a lot of lesions. And finally, he was also discussing about the sequences which you have to be uh, doing when you do intracranial monitoring. You should not be uh, doing FSE and the flare sequence where the, sub uh, the surface absorption rate is quite high. The, uh, there can be heating and patients can have problems because of the, that, that. So um, uh, you have to be very careful in uh, when you st uh, start doing all these uh, uh, techniques in the MR. Uh, the technique of 3D flare and 3D T1 was emphasized uh, by Joseph and also by Bijoy. Now, uh, you can see that many times uh, if you take this axial section here and you are just seeing about 200 of these axial sections. So remember that when you do a 3D sequence, unlike a 2D sequence when, where you get just 25 frames, which you have to look in, when you do a 3D sequence, there may be about 200 frames. Now you have to look at carefully at these images and there is highly likely chance that you might miss a lesion like this. It's very small in the axial section. So the importance is immediately you should go for a reconstruction and that should be in the axial and the coronal plane and then carefully look. Now in the sagittal here, you're unlikely to miss this lesion. It's a quite a large lesion. So many times what happens is when the radiologists and the neurologists are looking at the images, they might look at just one plane. Whenever you do a 3D sequence, it is important to look at all the three planes. You have to do the reconstruction on your PAX monitor and uh, do it. So that is, remember that this is very important. And why everyone is now talking about 3D sequences is because you know that sulcal morphometry, voxel-based morphometry, and very a lot of new techniques have come to understand the brain surface and the various signs associated with a depth of sulcus dysplasia is very well known, uh, the button sign and all. And such signs can be much better visualized in a sulcal morphometry. So it is important that uh, you get an information of the surface of the brain, the sulci and the gyri. That's why um, 3D is better. 2D might not give uh, that information very well. A focal atrophy, for example, in voxel-based morphometry, if you have to visualize, it is much better visualized on a, uh, a 3D uh, T1 weighted sequence. Of course, uh, the SNR is better on a high Tesla and there is no doubt about it. And we usually do in a three Tesla. Now, in my experience over the last several years, we, we have missed a lot of lesions. And if you really tell what are the lesions we have missed is uh, one is gliosis. An old infection would have uh, left a small gliotic area there. And uh, this would be in the occipital lobe or frontal lobe, 
And in the 3D sequences, again, as I was telling you, a lot of images you might miss it. 2D sequences, because of the thickness and the inter uh, uh, slice uh, gap, sometimes you might miss it. So it is important you do a 3D and try to look at it again in different planes for small cliotic lesions. Bijoy has given the importance of looking at hypothalamic hamartoma. Sometimes it might be visible only on the flare sequence. You might miss it in many all other sequences and it might be very small. So always look at the hypothalamus. You might not have gelastic seizures, but still uh, look there. The other thing I have missed is heterotopias. And this happens many times when the patient already has an MTS. So dual pathology, MTS is there. You, most of the radiologists stop it there. Okay, they report it. But carefully look at your all your images again and you might make, uh, uh, pick up a small heterotopia. And this patient actually had an MTS along with that a heterotopia. So, the, and along with heterotopia, you should look at the adjoining cortex. So the cortex might be abnormal. Now, over the years, in, uh, in, uh, in late 90, uh, 90s and uh, uh, in early 2000s, the flare sequence itself was not available. And after that, the, once the flare sequence uh, became available, we started picking up more lesions. And then came the susceptibility weighted imaging, where we started finding uh, the small calcifications. This was not seen in any other sequence. So you do the uh, SWI, small venous angiomas, uh, then cavernomas, and then uh, also uh, the presence of calcifications. And around that, there could be areas of gliosis, and that itself might be responsible for the seizure. So SWI came as a new contrast. The other contrast which uh, came and Bijoy told about this is a very important contrast. This is, this is perfusion image. And that is the ASL technique, the arterial spin labeling technique. And I, uh, this particular case, as you see in the flare images, it might be reported as normal. And actually, the resident who was reporting it actually told me that initially he had thought that it, this is a normal, but he did the the uh, arterial spin labeling and started seeing a lot of perfusion on only on one side and on this particular area this abnormal uh, sulcus and the cortex was responsible for the seizures actually eeg was also correlating with the same uh, uh, area so it is important that sometimes you might have to go back and see your flare sequences after doing an asl or an swi and then look for areas of gliosis or thickened uh, cortex now this is something which I always show this. I, I am sure one of the, the person who picked up this lesion is there uh, in this audience. And uh, this was picked up by the resident neurologist who was doing PDF with us. Uh, he came to me and uh, told that all the seizures are coming from the right frontal lobe. And I think that this is abnormal here. This we had missed. We had discussed in our department, we had missed this lesion. If you see that there is a long sulcus, you compare it with the opposite side and thickened cortex is there. There is no signal change. It does not look like a depth of sulcus dysplasia also. It could be depth, uh, but what is important is that thickening of the cortex is there and the deep sulcus is there. But if you look at the axial images, the lesion is much better seen. And even a small hyperintensity, I don't know whether you can actually see small hyperintensity extending towards the ventricle was there. No signal change, but the lesion was there. But how did he pick up? And we did not. It was because he knew the clinical details, video EEG and neuropsychology data, which the radiologists did not know. So whenever uh, uh, Joseph was uh, telling that an expert radiologist or a neuroradiologist will be able to pick up these lesions, I would add that a radiologist who is given the information about the clinical details, video EEG and neuropsychology will pick up the lesion. Not the one uh, who does not have any idea and most likely it is the neurologist who is going to pick, uh, pick up uh, these lesions. So we have to get the details uh, of the clinical history and the video EEG findings. Next, a lot of uh, discussion was there on functional neuroimaging. PET, we know uh, an extremely important tool. The problem is PET is adding more money uh, to the, uh, the uh, management of the patient. So now there is a lot of interest in resting state fMRI. DTI has been used, task-based fMRI has been used, and now we have reached the stage of resting state uh, functional MRI, and that has been used. These both papers are 2017 papers. One is uh, ours, which was published in AJNR, and the other is in the PLOS one, and a Chinese group had published it. 
uh, looks at importance of resting state not only in uh, detecting the epileptogenic zone by looking at the various uh, methods of resting state functional MRI pro uh, processing, independent component analysis, graph three, and different techniques they have used, and they have been able to pick up uh, the epileptogenic zone. But of course, this is evolving, and uh, if it comes up, uh, it will be uh, definitely a cheap to to uh, pick up uh, these uh, areas from where the seizures are originating. The other importance is uh, the lateralization uh, of language or mapping the eloquent cortex, like the motor cortex, by using, uh, using res resting state uh, analysis. Now, the problem in patients with epilepsy, especially children, is they don't do these tasks very well. When you do task-based fMRI, they do not lie down uh, for it uh, nicely, or if they lie down, they won't do the task. You give them a uh, verb generation task, and uh, they would be just sleeping, and we won't be getting anything. Here, if the patient can lie down somehow with the parent nearby, probably the resting state of MRI would be an alternate. And we have tried that, and we have found it it's quite a good technique. So eloquent cortex mapping is going to be useful. And finally, we have done some work on machine learning also. So what are we looking at these uh, salts and gare? You are looking at specific features. And what are the features? Abnormal deep sulcus, whether it is there, a thickened cortex is there, or a poor gray white distinction, or hyper uh, intense band, or whether there is an abnormal signal on the flare sequence. So these are some of the features that you are looking for for looking at subtle cortical dysplasias. And uh, all the things might not be there in uh, a single patient. Some of them might be there. Now, if you have a large data, then you can do, uh, train the computer in uh, identifying these features. And we had used convolutional neural network. This was a, a collaborative work with the National Institute of Technology, Suratkar. And uh, they had an AI group there with which uh, we work. And uh, what we found out was the detector, detection rate of this dysplasia was about 85%. Uh, so uh, of the 40, about 33 to 34 cases, they were able to detect it. So uh, machine learning is now going to come as a very important uh, to, uh, um, especially because you, I, I was telling you, there were so many images, flare images, every image having about 200, uh, this thing, so many salts and um, uh, diary, and you have to find out an abnormality in this. And it is very likely that the radiologist or the neurologist will miss it. And the machine learning is going to really help. And usually in radiology talks nowadays, machine learning is the last slide. And that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think we have come a full circle now. Um, the time is up, but we have some four questions posted by a few people here. Shall I read it out? Thank you so much, sir. That is quite wonderful. Whatever other two speakers have not covered, you had and stopped with artificial intelligence as well. Okay. So let me go into the questions. First is from as expected. Uh, the first man who shoots um multiple papers in the morning into the chitra alumni group is the first one to shoot the question here also dr joy has a question for dr bijal if you don't find anything how do you decide where to do the mr spectroscopy wonderful question <laughs> that's a very good question but uh, yeah. uh, you can actually do you can actually do uh, there are institutional conventions so for example the sick kids they will do always an intermediate spectroscopy in the right basal ganglia and uh, uh, I mean, sorry, the intermediate spectroscopy in the right basal ganglia and a uh, low uh, spectroscopy in the left peritrigonal region. What we usually you do is a multivoxel spectroscopy. You can cover a lot of area, including the ventricles. So usually we cover at the mid, uh, uh, I mean, uh, at the level of the basal ganglia covering the ventricles. For example, we have picked up lactate in the ventricles and we have picked up mitochondrial disorders. So that is what you can do now. You can do multivoxel spectroscopy at the level of the basal ganglia and look at different voxels. I'm really sorry that I uh, rushed through. I could have actually sp uh, spoken a little slowly, but I wanted to give a, an, uh, an introduction to the what MR can do today and how you have to analyze them. There was, uh, 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 Okay, I, I, I hope I answered these questions, but generally, for example, creatine transporter deficiency or mitochondrial diseases, 
wherever you put the voxel you are going to get it so if the basal ganglia basically because you are looking at a highly metabolic area when you are looking at a, a, a spectroscope i mean a lactates but other things which are you wherever you put you are going to get it this is there will be institutional conventions and most people do follow institutional conventions very important thing is that uh, you should always use the same protocol and same time otherwise you are going to misinterpret things thank you vijay um second one is from uh, dr anu parma sir in north indian settings where cystic sclerosis needs exclusion in every epilepsy is ct or mr the initial investigation of choice either one of you can take that vijay or keshav ji either one of you so, uh, so uh, i think yeah yeah, keshav, yeah yeah so um, uh, the initial investigation of course would uh, be naturally Uh, the CT, but you see when these cases are uh, coming as intractable epilepsy later on, and it is in those uh, situations you might have to uh, use it. Also, sometimes in the differential diagnosis of these conditions, uh, in comparison to other granulomatous infections, sometimes better than CT, the MR uh, uh, would give you uh, the diagnosis. So it is better. Uh, in certain uh, circumstances but usually a person coming with a seizure and in. this thing you can uh, do first a ct scan vijay you have uh, uh, i think uh, uh, now pretty much uh, with established sequence whatever uh, ct is uh, detecting you are actually detecting with the mr so ct only adds to 5 uh, millisieverts of uh, radiation in a child i think i will prefer an mr first if you are if you have the capability of doing an mri in the emergency situation but most of the time the mr may not be available in the emergency situation that's why you are going for a, a low dose ct especially you have to ask for a low dose ct in a pediatric patient we should not irradiate them depends upon the setting also whether they have an access to ct or mr is also a question in many of the north indian hospitals uh, the next one uh, the the whoever has placed the question i have no no name is here they want to know the person wants to know about mr pet i think mr pet fusion probably who wants to take it joseph you are relaxing man i i, I don't have any exposure to mr pet okay so uh, one of you can. so uh, the mr pet at, at the moment is available as you know in uh, two institutions in india one is in imhans and another is in apollo delhi and uh, they are uh, doing some uh, uh, studies on mr pet uh, more than that i actually do not know wh what is uh, uh, in what all indications uh, they specifically uh, do it but the one advantage that you will get is you can get the information functional information with the mr and the uh, pet at the same time that would be possible so that should be uh, the ad uh, advantage which they are looking for but what sort of uh, cases actually go uh, there for uh, as in for pre surgical uh, i i have no idea i think uh, the mr pet can be done in two ways doing mri and pet at the same time or in two different times and co registering so if you want to do mri and pet at the same time for example you are looking at not protein uh, uh, metabolites like for oxygen pet you want to do the metabolism so all those of uh, advanced studies you need an mri and pet together the problem is that it's very expensive almost 40 crores for in the indian scenario to get an mr pet uh, but right now the, uh, the price would have come down at least 30 crores you definitely you need but if you get mri and pet for a pro probably for 15 to 18 crores you can get but you have but you will not get the simultaneous information you will be just a co registering one or another so that is uh, the difference so uh, i think uh, most of the time i think mr pet is an unless you are doing research it is it's just a yeah. luxury in fact co registration we are doing now itself in yeah, our the institution the dicomb images we are doing it uh, yeah. even uh, now we have moved on from ct to mr right we have uh, with the dicomb images we are doing i don't think uh, the question that was asked was probably what you said earlier the two centers which do have that but that is in a research board still so the next is again from joy what are the three dimensions in the 3d sequence keshav das ji the dimensions is actually uh, um, the you you acquire it in one uh, sagittal plane and once you acquire it in a sagittal plane in an isotropic voxel 1 into 1 into 1 uh, 
uh, works of 1 mm into 1 mm, 1 mm is the voxel size. So it's very small, it is very high resolution images uh, taken in the sagittal, uh, which may be seven to eight minutes of time. And then once you take it, you can reconstruct it on the monitor itself, or either on the MR monitor or on the PAX monitor, you can reconstruct it in the coronal plane as well as on the axial plane. Now, if you want to even uh, 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 plan it along the, um, the hippocampus, even that is possible. So any plane, even you can, you have to have a, um, a reconstruction uh, in any plane uh, would be possible. So usually what we do is sagittal, coronal, as well as um, axial, and then look at all the Im uh, images in these three planes. How to distinguish postictal changes from an epileptic lesion from Deepak? That's an often asked question. So Vijoy has some uh, rules of thumb or one, two, three, four, you can put it. No, I think it is a very difficult question to answer. Yeah, I so know. in the if the, the first uh, only if you have only one scan, it will be almost impossible to say whether this is just a postictal phenomenon or is it actually a nictal. I mean, uh, there is a, actually a, a lesion there. So many a times we have actually diagnosed, for example, cortical dysplasias, which have turned out to be autoimmune encephalitis or other things which are with the lesion disappearing, which one example I've already shown. So uh, having said that, uh, there are very subtle uh, signs which may be very important because if you see that Raghavendra has actually picked up for the first time in our institute, he has also published uh, that if you have the white matter hypo-intensity, hypo-intensity underlying this uh, swollen gray matter, then it suggests mostly a postictal. But the problem is that it can also be seen in other conditions like hyperglycemia or other things. So, uh, for example, if you see secondary changes in the splenium or the corpus callosum in a, when you have a lesion in the a parietal cortex, for example, so this uh, most likely represent there is a postictal phenomenon. So there can be even enhancement after ictal, uh, uh, this thing after several weeks of time, it will actually uh, reduce. So uh, having said that, uh, if you see a hyperperfusion, a very high perfusion in ASL, most of the time it uh, represents uh, a postictal uh, phenomenon. That's what our uh, our uh, uh, our understanding and our experience is. But without the follow up, to be sure, on the first scan itself is extremely difficult. Okay, well said. Next is from Sri Kumar. Dr. Bichoy, how do you go ahead with nodes and edges concept in fMRI, functional MRI? So that is a very important thing and that's what uh, Dr. Keshu told. In resting state fMRI now, many people are using actually for epilepsy research to find out these uh, nodal network uh, uh, hypothesis. But I'm not sure about how they are using it for uh, epilepsy surgery. If you are not seeing anything, whether they will go for only based on uh, resting state networks that uh, they are operating anything. I think Cleveland will have a maximum experience. Dr. Musa can actually highlight on that. Musa Ji. Sorry, I zoned out. Can you repeat that, please? This is so, an anarchy uh, only, Musaji. <laughs> you remember the anarchy, no? <laughs> now you are the anarchy here. <laughs> so he is asking, how do you identify nodes and uh, this thing, networks based on fMRI, resting state fMRI, and whether it will be used for a routine preoperative workup and surgical decisions? Uh, I suspect that the question is related to epileptogenic zones, networks and nodes, is there what it is? I, yeah. I don't know how, how you can use the rest of the MRI, FMRI for, for those, those concepts. The way I understand uh, in the epileptogenic, epileptogenic network is, the network is composed of multiple nodes and some of them are the major nodes that may be the primary driver and causing the epilepsy. And it's probably not, uh, it's, it's, it's a concept that has to, uh, the conclusion has to come from analysis of several different aspects of the case. Uh, I don't think any single uh, modality is oh. is appropriate oh. or efficient oh, to, to come control. to the final point. Uh, maybe except in some discrete form, case, yes, the imaging may be the identifying the node. But other than Another that, way. it has to be a comprehensive Another evaluation way. of all the information available for the patient's epileptogenic network okay um this was something which uh, dr sujit was uh, uh, asking me two days back they had a hypothalamic hematoma which is completely resected and uh, for the 
seizures are still remaining the same. So, is it again due to the fact that a network has been formed and the multiple nodes are there which are active? This is an addendum to Musaji's answer to the question. It's quite unrelated, but yesterday Sujit was uh, putting forward this question. He had a hypothalamic hematoma operated. It went up very well. The whole thing came out, but after a few days also the patient has no benefit out of it. So I would so like again, to answer. Yeah, sure. I would like not not about this one question uh, specifically to, to avoid a confusion which I've, what I've, I've told. There was a, a, a question from uh, Dr. Rajesh about uh, cavernous angioma and also multiple questions, sub-questions on that. The cavernous angiomas, uh, they are not called cavernomas anymore because cavernoma sounds like it's a tumor. They're cavernous angiomas and now uh, they, that term is also uh, getting changed. So uh, they, 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 they are uh, uh, cavernous malformations and uh, the 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 question was developmental venous anomaly whether it will bleed. Bleed would be very uh, very rarely. See, uh, DBA and cavernoma are they yeah. one and the same? That's yeah, the it is. It is. They are not the same. Mm -hmm. So they are not the same. DVA has got a multiple medusa head appearance and that DVA sometimes will be associated with the cavernomas and usually the cavernoma part will be the one which is bleeding. After bleeding, we will not see, we will not be able to differentiate. In this particular case, we could see the medusa head and also on post contrast scans, which I have not shown, we can see that the collector vein actually draining into the one of the cortical veins, then subsequently into the superior sagittal fence. That's why I put as a DVA. So, DVA alone, can it bleed? Yes, when there is a stenosis of the collector vein. So sometimes it can bleed without the presence of a cavernous angioma or a developmental cavernous malformation. The question Rajesh was asking whether we should, whether it can bleed quite often, whether we should actually tell the parents whether it can bleed. So that the chance of bleeding is supratendural cavernoma, if it is not associated with the familial cavernous angiomatosis, is less than 1% per year. So it has got a much less bleeding chance compared to AVMs, which has got much higher, of 4 to 5% up to maximum. So, but when it is associated with the familial cavernous angiomatosis and when it is involving the infratentural compartments as well as the spine, for example, brainstem cavernoma, it has got a, at least 10 times higher risk of uh, bleeding per year. So it all depends on the position and whether it is familial or uh, non-familial. Another thing Musa was telling is that developmental venous anomalies, cavernomas, all these things can be associated with the uh, malformations of cortical development, especially focal cortical dyspasias. So when you are actually resecting them, you should also account for these developmental venous anomalies because it can, act after surgery, if they are using a very focal resection, can have a larger venous infarct because the collector vein, they are draining the normal parenchyma also. That is the importance of surgically, preoperatively understanding or identifying a DVA in an FCD. I hope I answered that question. Uh yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, I think we'll go for the last question now, since it's almost uh, late. It's about ASL. Again, one of you can answer. Do you routinely do for all the epilepsy cases? This is what we are into a fight in most of the PMC. So one of you can take it. Um, do you routinely do ASL in all the epilepsy cases? Does it need more time? How much more time? Is it only useful if done close to clinical seizures? These are what the questions Musa has raised. Yes, of course, we do it in all the cases now. That much I can answer. And the rest I leave it up to both of them. So I think uh, what? Uh, Keshu can tell. Yeah, Vijay, you tell. Go so, and inspect. So, um, uh, ASL, like uh, uh, Dr. Asha told, it is actually a poor man's pet or a poor man's pet in cert certain cases. It could, act, act, it, could, it could act as both. That's what you are uh, in the in rectal phase. It is more like a pet and in rectal phase, it will more act more like a spect. Actually, it is more towards spect because it is actually looking at the perfusion rather than metabolism. So why we are doing, because we have a 3D pseudo-continuous ASL with FSC readout, which is very, very important, which is the ISMR recommended sequence. So many people, uh, they have very different ASL sequences in different uh, centers. Some people have only pulsed ASL with an EPA gradient, which is much inferior compared to what we have. We can actually see the perfusion like in the parenchyma, not the vessels. So in the parenchyma, it actually gives almost pet-like images. So when you have, you can, uh, when there is, there are several papers which are telling that there is a perfusion to metabolism match, matching. So whenever you are seeing an interictal 
uh, hyperperfused hypermetabolic area in the pet similar finding can be seen in asl but we have seen some cases we are actually having a discordance between pet and asl also the importance is that it is very cheap to do because if you have a 3d pseudo continuous asl especially but the problem is that you should have a 3t 1.5 tesla signal will be very low uh, but you can still do but the signal will be low it takes almost a four and a half minutes to five minutes additional time but it's actually very useful why useful because for example if in uh, in the western uh, countries routinely it is being used that when you are actually detecting for example tuberous sclerosis you have to find out uh, multiple pet traces including an alpha methyl tryptophan pet so because asl has actually and if first you do a ftg pet to look at whether the hypo metabolic areas then you do a alpha methyl tryptophan pet to see that where its avid uptake is there that is most ra more radiation and more uh, ready pharmaceutical so asl is a poor man's pet it will show uh it is something like ftg pet then you can actually go for your advanced pet so that is the usefulness of asl okay i think i'll go to the last question because it's from dr sunil narayan sir is here i think uh, he has a question that uh, in ig or gge because there was a confusion regarding that also if the mri is normal how frequently uh, would you see focal receptable lesions where epilepsy may respond to surgery I think I would take that question because uh, some time back we did uh, we looked into a series of around six fifty or six sixty patients and we had twelve patients who had a combination of uh, MPS or TLE TLE due to other lesions plus a very classical idiopathic generalized epilepsy. I think we subjected all these patients for surgery and um, I haven't gone uh, and seen what they are doing now, but most of them are doing well. At least uh, uh, two years follow up, all of them were doing well. And few of them, at least fifty percent, are still now on a small dose of sodium valproate. That's the answer which I can give. Which anybody wants to contribute to that, uh, you are welcome. And at that point of time, that was in two thousand twelve. Uh, there were only one or two other series which again showed the same thing. But out of uh, six fifty, we had twelve who had a combination of IG and MTAD classically. There were a few studies uh, from, uh, I think. Uh... Peter Fox and uh, some from Abu Dhabi, but they had shown some focal cortical lesions uh, in what looked like a quote-unquote idiopathic uh, primary generalized seizures of childhood onset. Uh, this was a little bit uh, gathering some momentum at some time. Then I saw, uh, of course, I had not been following up much on this. So our uh, uh, what do the radiology Uh, imaging team say, uh, or Dr. Uh, Musa, or I mean, uh, any of you can uh, enlighten on this? So we have the uh, neurologists say. I think neurologists, because this is more like a neurology. Uh, this thing, I'm uh, sure uh, Dr. Musa would be like to say. So we have definitely seen patients who look like you are. a garden variety of uh, adolescent onset generalized epilepsy with gtcs myoclonic jerks uh, zoning out is absence like uh, or a combination of these things uh, secondary to malformations and these malformations are usually subtle and we these are probably definitely rare cases uh, and uh, we have had uh, success there was there was at least one patient uh, i remember in the last 3 years who had to emergently operate it because he's having too many seizures we had some focality that was evolving on serial multiple evaluation which showed some focality on the left side and we we did some invasive monitoring there was some suspicion of dysplasia and we had to do a large frontal resection to to stop his seizures and he has been doing really well from daily multiple seizures to none for 3 years except for one episode when he was when he stopped his medications so those kind of uh, uh, seemingly generalized epilepsy due to due to some focal lesions can happen even at old age group this kind these things are very common in younger age group with west syndrome or lanas gesto like phenotype or electrical status with focal lesions very well known but similar things can happen in older age but it's probably extremely rare and the, the phenotype again is depending upon the age at which the epilepsy starts So in these patients, when they start in the teenage years, I tend to think that they probably will have something like a JME-like phenotype. They are probably extremely rare, but it, it can happen. 
And as Asha said, uh, you could have a combination of uh, generalized epilepsy and focal epilepsy. So the patient who has mesial temporal cirrhosis undergoing temporal lobectomy, they, they have a, a, an associated a partial epilepsy. So that's different, you know. You treat the medication, you continue medication for generalized epilepsy, you take care of the focal epilepsy by surgery. Uh, that's also, uh, I think, uh, we have seen it in, in Chitra in training as well as later as well. So uh, if I reframe just one last question, last sentence, uh, how vigorously, uh, suppose the epilepsies are intractable and you don't find any uh, other causes, metabolic and all, and uh, say the C, uh, MR looks sort of normal, 1.5T at least, epilepsy protocol, how vigorously would you chase for any of these uh, functional structural focal lesions? Or do you leave it at that point and try to do some other surgical measures like say, tummy strotomy or other spiral resections and that kind of thing? So do you really try to chase for any focal lesion and try to see whether it is the epileptogenic uh, focus? So if we have a suspicion that this could be a focal epilepsy, you know, if the, if the EG was showing some focality, if there is something there, uh, if it is refractory, we, we go all the way through and see what happens. If there is any hypothesis evolving to suggest intracranial monitoring. So we may do a PET scan. And of course, this may not be the standard practice everywhere, um, but uh, in patients who are refractory epilepsy, if there is any remote suspicion of focality emerging in video EEG, in particular, that's probably your uh, your primary test that is going to guide you. Okay, it's worth chasing, looking for focality by additional testing. You may do a PET, ictospect, and revisit. Sometimes when you record more and more seizures, your focality may emerge. That that's that's another thing we we have. So uh, primarily guided by EEG and. Uh... That's correct. You need to have a an electroclinical phenotype that is driving. In, in general, for epilepsy surgery, one of the two things has to be there. Either there should be a focal lesion or there should be a focality in electroclinical. If neither of this is there, you probably are not, most patients are not surgical. This is probably a ground truth for all cases, all ages. Uh, thank you, Dr. Musa, and thank you, Dr. Ashlata, for. Yeah. Thank you, sir, and okay. thank you, Musaji. I think it was a very wonderful session, and uh, many people want this to be in the YouTube. So we have done um, something for that. And uh, Opal's talk, Hanu, uh, Bobby, and this one, we'll be uploading it together in the next one or two days. So with that, I think we can conclude the session. We have it every Saturday. If I'm allowed, okay. I can actually... You are always allowed, Vijay. Whatever no. you want, you say. No, please don't uh, upload this because it was are like you? 100 uh, miles per uh, second. So I can ah, actually talk a little slower <laughs> and actually make people understand. But uh, Asha has given me only 20 minutes and I have to show, show many, so many things. I gave I'm you 20 sorry. minutes. That doesn't mean that you have to pack 2,000 things and come. That's not yeah, what I, I meant. Know, I know that it was my mistake. I'm sorry for that. But if you are interested, I can actually speak slower and uh, make people understand. I, I see many comments that people are no, not no, no, used no. to ASL and uh, DPI okay. and all. So some some basic understanding of that is also important for uh, many people. So see, my with is all that, due respect to all of them, I think uh, talks should not be redefined and then again modified in such a way. That's not proper. No? So I'm just asking you another question. If you're going to talk about ASL and DPI for half an hour or one hour, how certain are you that these people are going to attend? That is another question. Yeah. So, goodbye. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.